Magic and Religion, the Individual and Society. I made an earlier video about one of the problems between magical cultures and religious cultures, and that is the holistic nature of magical thinking means that the relationship to evil and the problem of evil is very different from that in the religious culture. Now, I think an even greater problems arise from the contrast between the individualism of magical culture and the group thinking or herd mind of a religious culture. Now to me this is very fundamental to religious culture because I define religious cultures in terms of the way a set of ideas or hypotheses bind people together into a coherent group and obviously a religion is a very obvious example of that um, but also a political theory um, it could be membership of a profession an academic discipline or supporting a particular football team these are all things where people are united to a very coherent group clearly defined against those who are outside the group now it's been said that um, in scientific culture, a statement is not meaningful unless it can be disproved. And because I like symmetries and analogies, I suggest that a religious statement is not meaningful unless it can be disbelieved. Now, of course, disbelieved is not the same as um, unbelievable. To give an example, um, you couldn't really found a religion on the basis of the idea that the sun is going to rise every day, because it so obviously does. But you could found a religion on the basis that the only reason the sun rises every morning is because our priests stay up all night doing rituals to make it rise. In other words, you can't bind people into a group, a distinct group, unless there are people outside the group and that means you have to have a philosophy or an idea which other people cannot believe in. So for example um, the idea that uh, workers could rule the world and still be workers, um, that kicking a ball, a leather ball into a net is the most important thing in the world or that the only way to look at a certain problem is through a certain academic discipline and it should not be mixed with other disciplines. These are all ideas which um, are very powerful ideas, but it is possible for other people to disbelieve them, and therefore you get uh, a culture that is united um, in religio, means binding together, um, but uh, there are others outside. Now, the fact that magic begins with a very individualist, inward-looking approach. Um, An initiation is very much a personal development. Uh, means that it sets itself apart from the group. And that causes a lot of antagonism. If you think of the way that our predominantly religious and scientific culture berates magical culture, you know, the me generation. The way people, the media responds to things like, you know, find your inner child workshops and all that, you know, navel gazing, inward turning, selfish, individualistic, thinking only of themselves, all these sort of phrases. Um, and that comes from the fact that anyone who turns in as an individual and takes an individual stance is, in a sense, withdrawing from the group, becoming an outsider, a scapegoat. Now this idea of the individual versus the group has got some truth, but I think it is actually, um, it misses the point. You see, when you start a magical practice and you start looking inside yourself, observing your subjective elements. You begin to find out that the idea of the unitary self 
is a bit of an illusion. I first noted this when I was at school and um, as a school kid it was considered very cool and grown up to stay up all night. Well I tried it because I wanted to be cool and grown up but actually I hated it because I was aware that the me that goes to bed at night is a very different from me from the one that gets up in the morning and staying up all night brought these two me's face to face and I found it a very uncomfortable and awkward experience. I never got used to it. But if you've read my book, you know, the little book of demons, you realize that there are many, many voices inside. And um, I was rather intrigued uh, a week or two back. Someone introduced me to the YouTube video of um, Grant Morrison speaking at uh, Disinformation. And you can find it on, on YouTube. And he points out very graphically how we're not actually just one individual inside. We are, as it were, a multitude of beings. Some years ago, well, many years ago, when I had completed my first book, which was a uh, sort of curious type of novel, I mean, basically as a mathematician, you know, how do I write a book to explain the ideas? And I had funny ideas like, it was going to be written in 3D, you'd have to read it through 3D spectacles to get all the layers of meaning. And then I realised that actually the way this is done is you have a cast of characters all speaking. So I sort of took myself to bits, um, took, looked at each of the individual planets in my horoscope um, and their relationship with the others and you know, their sign and aspects and so on and so forth and created a set of characters and then let them run loose. Um, the result was uh, a curious book, not very successful. Um, I sent it off to various publishers and got absolutely no response. And yet, um, when I showed it to some people, they said, well, there's a lot of very good stuff in here, really, but it's unpublishable. So, what do I do with a book which seems to have some important messages in it? You know, that I, I felt really could be useful for mankind, you know. Um, and yet it's unpublishable. And then I realised that possibly the best thing I could do, in view of the fact that um, at school I'd been in the RAF section, so I'd had a bit of flying training, and I was working for an aircraft industry, so I had access to um, uh, um, free or low-cost training on um, aircraft, including jet aircraft, that the best thing I could do, if this was a message which was really important for humanity, the best thing I could do would be to um, learn to fly a jet and fill it up full with fuel and drive it, dive bomb it at high speed into the Houses of Parliament, where the kinetic energy would blow the whole thing to rubble. I realised if I did that, although I would be dead, the press, the media, academics would find out all about me, they'd find my, my manuscript, they would analyse it, write articles about it, write theses on it, that type of thing. Um, and all my ideas would be out in the world and everyone would know about them and the world would be saved. What a wonderful idea. But have an idea like that and it creates enormous internal debate because there were many other voices. Voices which said, but it's wrong to kill people. Voice which said, oh, but you'll be destroying a lovely old building. Um, voices which said, oh, but it's, there's nothing nobler than giving your life for a good cause, a great idea, especially if it helps humanity. Another voice that said, well, what about all the politicians you would kill? And another voice which said, what could be more hygienic than killing a lot of politicians? And so on and so forth. Well, basically, um, this debate went on for ages. And uh, you see, this wouldn't really be possible or easy uh, in a strictly religious context. Um, you know how when something, someone suggests something like this, the media says, and the politicians say, this is absolutely unthinkable. Well, that seemed ridiculous to me because I thought of it. Um, uh, the thing was that I'd given all these voices, these internal voices, the vote. And... Um, the idea was outvoted. 
And the sort of arguments were, well, um, is it really, can any idea actually be greater and more important than the human mind that is containing it? In particular, here was I at about the age of 25, I'd come up ideas which, well, if they were ideas that could save the world, why don't I live on? Just think of how many more ideas I could come up with in the future. I owed it to the world to stay alive. And so on. Many, many voices all putting their vote in and I voted to live on. <laughs> now, um, you see, basically, I'd allowed myself to have an inner democracy. Many people speak in praise of democracy and say what a good thing, but I'm not sure very many people actually test it, try it out, learn their lessons from creating an inner democracy. It takes two things. It takes courage, because um, what if a rabble rouser takes over the democracy? Uh, you know, it's to think of all the terrible ideas which might take over your mind. But it also takes trust. Trust in the wisdom of the crowd. Trust that if all the voices in you are given free reign and listened to and allowed to say their bit, that actually, in general, a good consensus will emerge. And I feel in my case, it, it did emerge. Some people might still say I should have given my life in order to spread the word, but um, I'm fairly happy with the way my life has turned out. You see, um, if you hold to a certain principle, a certain idea, something that bind you together, and you think of yourself as having a God-given soul, then any voice like, um, oh God, I want to kill that person, oh, that must be a demon, that's outside. It gets locked up, it gets bent away. That is an inner dictatorship. And that, I think, is what most people are encouraged to that's the way they encourage to live. Whereas actually pursuing the magical path, really exploring inside yourself, you find that you're not really in the position of being a lonely, selfish individual against the humanity that is all around you, the group, the tribe, or the religion, or whatever. Actually, you're making a choice between two different groups. The inner group, and the outer group. And that's a very different question altogether. And in some ways, I would say, it's a good idea to learn the skills of communicating, finding compromises, politicizing, if you like, by working on your inner democracy before you try to make statements about what should happen in the outside world. In a second video, I'm going to go on with some of the real problems that arise when you take this approach.